is Jesus? Right, that's the question in this series. Who is Jesus? NBC came out with a special, 2015, called Finding Jesus, Fact or Fiction. Uh, CNN, or rather, CNN came out with that. NBC came out with something a lot more interesting. CNN came out with a superstar Jesus. Jesus Christ, the superstar, starring John Legend. It's like popular society wants to know the answer to that question as well. Who is Jesus? Don't move here. Okay. Who is Jesus? I'm not saying that these popular ideas are something I'm necessarily for or necessarily against, but what I am saying is that popular society or people around us want to know the answer to that question. And the way we answer that question is going to become very important. What we want to do with this series is to take a look at what tradition says about Jesus. No, not really. We didn't want to take a look at what tradition said about Jesus. We didn't want to look at what the old church you went to as a kid said about Jesus or what grandma says about Jesus. We want to look at what Jesus says about himself, which is the whole point of the series. Who is Jesus according to Jesus? What we did last week was we looked at an I am statement. Uh, the I am statement we looked at was I am the light. And Rick talked about that and what that meant for Jesus to be the light. But we want to also discuss what that has to do with us. I mean, after all, we are 2,000 years removed from these narratives. So what does that have to do with us? What does it mean for us? So those two questions are kind of the framework for this series. Who did Jesus say he was, and what does that have to do with me? Today we're going to be in John 18. So if you have a Bible, please flip there. If you have a phone, scroll there, tap there, find a way to get there. And if you don't know how to get there, it should be on the slides above. John 18, it's, it's a heavy passage. I really love this passage, and I use that term love loosely because this passage is really, like I said, heavy. There's a lot of tension, a lot of back and forth, a lot of mixed emotions involved in this passage. And I think for a lot of us, this passage today is going gonna, is gonna to challenge us, and it's going to challenge our comfortability with it. So it's going to be super fun, so please follow along. We're going to be in chapter 18 of the book of John, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of Kidron, where, the, where there was a garden in which he had entered with his disciples. Jesus crosses over the Kidron Valley into a grove of olive trees. So we're going to walk pretty slow through this, through this passage. We're going to walk really slow because John is going to give us a bunch of details. They're going to help paint us a picture of the last moments for Jesus. So in Jerusalem, there's this giant 37-acre big thing called... Um, Sorry about that. It's called Herod's Temple. It's called Herod's Temple. And right behind that is Kidron's Valley. So you would leave through the back side of the temple and it would, you'd, you'd go down the slope and it would kind of go up towards the Kidron Valley. And at the, at the very top is the Mount of Olives. Right under that, right at the base, is the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane, that literally translated into the wine press. It was where they painted, where it's where they, uh, Oh, geez, it's where they pressed wine. Goodness gracious. Let's pick up back up in verse 2. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place for Jesus, had, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. So John's giving us insight right now on the mob that's about to come out for Jesus. Some translations say cohort, others say contingent, uh, historical documentation give us insight that a contingent or a cohort is roughly 600 soldiers. We have some historical documentation that say it's as little as 200 soldiers. So also the temple guards being there during the, moment of, during the time of Jesus and the time of the Passover, uh, there's a historical setting, that's the historical setting for us this morning with roughly 200 temple guards. So let's play it safe. On the low side of the contingent or Roman cohort, you have maybe... 200 people. On the low side of the uh, Roman temple guards, you have, the th you have about 100. So you got a, an army of 300 armed military professionals coming out to arrest this one guy. And John goes on to say they were armed with lanterns and torches and weapons. They were fully armed. They were a SWAT team. John includes this because he wants us to know that they were fearful that Jesus was going to slip out. See, Jesus had done this before, but when they, were, when they were pressing him into the corner, Jesus said, hey, it's not really my time yet, so he pieced on out, he left, and he escaped. Right now, there's about 300 armed military professionals coming at him, and they're fearful. I mean, after all, it is the night. They're fearful that he's going to go and escape. 
So John is painting us this picture. There's details about the location, the amount of people, and the emotion in this, in this image. Let's pick back up in verse 4. So Jesus, knowing all these things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? And that's a loaded statement. Jesus fully understood, Julie, or Jesus fully understood and fully knew exactly what was going to happen. And I think we get a little comfortable with these, with these passages, with these texts. But I want John to paint this picture for us. You know, Jesus rolls in in Luke 19. He comes in, and it's called the triumphal entry because people are laying palm branches aside, and they're shouting, Jesus, hail King of Jesus, Hosanna in the highest. Following that narrative, as these people are screaming, Jesus looks out in verse 41, and he begins to weep as he looks out over Jerusalem because he knew of the one thing that's going to bring peace. If only they knew what God was doing. Can you guys imagine how deeply broken Jesus is in this moment? As people are cheering for him and, and chanting his name, all he hears is the own kind of weight that's pressing on him, the pressure of if only they knew what is going to come. John records a similar time frame in John 12. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came for this hour. And that weight just crushes him. It's like John was trying to paint this picture for us. Even the garden was named the wine press because that's what was, that's what was going on with him. Jesus was, such, was under such agony and duress during the moment of utter betrayal, arrest, trial, and crucifixion. Luke records this prayer in the garden right before the arrest. Scholars deduce possibly two hours before the moment. In Luke 22, verse 42, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And I have, hard, I have a hard time with these, with these types of verses because it uses a very distinct language, the cup of suffering. This language is always used to refer to God's wrath, the idea that God's pouring his wrath out on whoever is the cup, whoever's taking the cup. And in that moment, the weight of the sin of the world, like everything we've ever done, the fury, the wrath of God is being displayed, being poured all over Jesus. And he's feeling the weight of all of it. It's why in Luke 22, verse 44, he says, he prays so intensely that the vessels in his face burst to the point that the blood seeped through his pores. He was bleeding and sweating. Jesus' closest friends are trying to tell us just how Jesus was feeling that night. They paint this dark picture for us. And I wrestle with that because I think we make these moments really cheap. You know, we don't fully articulate and fully understand just how dark and how awful this moment was. We kind of make it pla like a plastic version of the gospel, just so that it's an easier pill for us to swallow. But it's almost as if, with the painting that John is coming through with us, that John is giving us with the emotion, the location, the details with the army, that he's trying to paint for us this, this, this version of the gospel that's screaming at us, don't overlook this. Just stop for a moment and think about how Jesus already knew everything that was going to become how he knew one of his disciples was leading the charge and how the one on his side who is ready to draw his sword in just hours is going to betray him, how the political party is going after him, how the disciples are all going to abandon him, how when he dies, no one's going to be waiting outside the tomb for him. In that moment, John is telling us that Jesus knew he was all alone. Because in that moment, he also knew that the Father was going to turn his face from him. Can you think about how agonizing that is? How painful that is to know that you're completely alone. The very thing, the very person, your God that has sustained you for so long is going to turn his face on you. Think about that. Think about the darkest moments in our lives. The time when life was the hardest for you, when it was the hardest to get out of bed. We look at our circumstances, our own depressions, our own anxieties and issues, and we use every excuse we can think of to not move forward. Instead, we tend to step back. We retreat. We use those circumstances. We use all the excuses we can think of. Jesus, hours before telling his disciples in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. What Jesus is saying is, hey guys, look, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave for a little bit. But while I'm gone, I want you to go out and love each other. 
I want you to go and love people in the sacrificial kind of way, the kind of love that doesn't deserve it, the kind of love that doesn't look at the things that they have done to you or said to you or are going to do it to you. I want you to demonstrate what love really looks like. Then he shows them what it looks like. He doesn't just tell them how to love. He shows them how to love. He steps into it. So how do we get through this passage without questioning every motive that we have, every moment, every moment that we're thinking about an action that we're going to do, how do we make it through this moment without feeling the slightest of conviction? Because, I mean, after all, how much of our love is actually 100% conditional? Right? I mean, the God of the universe that came out against him when he had done nothing wrong and stepped into the sacrificial kind of love, and I look at my own life and how many of my relationships are so conditional, like, I'm not going to forgive you, I'm not going to love you until you do this or show this, spend six months out in the doghouse. I mean, think about all the layers we put on people. And Jesus told his followers, that's not my kind of love. That's the love of the world. The world will know you're mine because of the love, because of that one quality. They're going to see you loving people despite themselves, just like me. A bunch of doubting, unfaithful, betraying people and when you can see the love of God and when you can put the ar- your arms around that type of love, that's the love that will change lives. I think he steps forward as a demonstration to his closest followers. This is what your life needs to be. Because in verse 5, they answered him, Jesus the Nazarene, they asked, he asked, the Roman, he asked the Roman cohort, what are you guys looking for? Who are you guys looking for? He replies, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So they say, oh, we're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. This is the context. This is the backdrop of the I am statement, I am he. In the original Greek, there are just two words, ego eimi. It's the same phrase that takes all of us back 2,000 years to when God was talking about delivering his people with this guy named Moses. He says, Moses, I'm going to send you. I'm going to redeem my people. I'm going to bring them out. I'm going to carry them. I'm going to do the work. I'm going to do all of this to bring them to the promised land. All I need you to do is go and tell Pharaoh about this. And do you guys know what Moses did in that moment? Moses rose to the occasion, and he rescued the Israelites out of captivity. I mean, later on. But in that moment, Moses is talking to God, and he's like, God, I don't really speak too good. God, I don't really know how this is going to work. God, I can't do this. God, I kind of was in Egypt just a couple moments ago, and it just it didn't really work out. But he kept pushing out all these excuses. And you know what God did all those years ago? God stepped in. He stepped forward and said, you go tell them that I am. I'm going to do the work, even though you are disobedient people. I will demonstrate this to you because I am. The beauty of the scriptures is that this is the message, cover to cover. So what do you do with this? What do you do when you're confronted with the reality of what God has done for you despite what you've already done, despite everything that you have done? And he calls you to love people, but you're like, I don't really love people like that. I love people who are like me. I love people who look like me, who dress like me, and talk like me. I love people who believe in the things that I like. I love people who vote like I do. But when you get outside of all these, when you get outside the rubric, then I don't really have that much love for you. But Jesus says, he steps in and he says, that's not my way. So let's find out Jesus, let's find out how Jesus shows his way in verse 6. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore he again asked them, whom do you speak? Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Because once more he's like, You're look, who are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. That's what's going on. Verse 8, Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, then let these go their way. He says, I'm telling you, it's me. The, name you, the person you want, the name on the arrest warrant, that's me. But, he says, since it's me, I want you to let these guys go. Even in the darkest moment, Jesus is concerned with the well-being of who he's around, of his friends. Have we ever been like that? Are we like that? In the darkest moments, the moments when it's hard to get out of bed, are concerned about our friends? Are we concerned about those who are around? Isn't it in those moments that we get really selfish and we shy away from people and we shy away from what God would want us to do in those moments? We use our circumstances and our issues, like I said, to step back 
But the picture of invitation that Jesus is inviting us into is to step forward into that. I want everyone to walk out of here with the understanding that when Jesus says, I am he, what Jesus is really saying is, I am what sacrificial love. I am the demonstration in the flesh of what sacrificial love looks like. Even up until his own death, he literally hangs on the cross and he prays for people. Did you guys know that? That as, on the, as he's on the cross, his, bu- his body torn open like, a, like an open wound, fighting against the elements, pulling himself up just for oxygen, is praying a prayer, Father, forgive these people for they do not know what they have done. That's the God we follow. That's my God. That's the God of the New Testament, the one that's constantly saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's what our life should look like. And that's why I struggle with this passage in John 18. Jesus knows everything. John already told us about that. He reiterated that over and over. And yet, in the darkest moment, he's still concerned with his life. And he's concerned with his disciples. So why doesn't he just tell them to go home? Why didn't after the, right after that meal, didn't he just tell tell the disciples, hey, go home. Go get some rest. Because tomorrow, tomorrow's going to be a really long day. Why does he want his disciples to be there? Why does Jesus want the disciples to see this moment? And why does John want us to see this moment? I'm going to jump to the book of Acts, uh, specifically chapter 3. So there are four historical narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then after that is the historical account of what happened after Jesus ascended into heaven. So Jesus came back from the dead, spoiler alert, sorry guys, and gave his spirit to the followers, to his followers. Then in Acts, we see them living out that truth, that power and truth and love and faith. Picking up in Acts 3, verse 2, And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried all along, whom they set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. So Peter and John, they're walking, and they see this guy, and this guy's crippled from birth, and he's begging for money, because that's what you did when you were crippled from birth. You couldn't really do anything but beg for money, and that's how you lived. And so Peter and John are walking. They see this crippled guy, and, Peter, and, he, and they, he reaches out to Peter and John, and he's like, hey, do you guys have any money? And Peter and John are like, nah, we don't have any money. What we do have is this. And a mic drop moment is when they heal the crippled man. But then tension starts to, starts to rise. Verse 9 and 10, the crowd goes wild. They're like, wait a second, we saw Jesus doing that kind of stuff. But now you're his followers and you're doing that kind of stuff. What does this mean? And the religious leaders, they catch wind of this. And everything's happening really fast. And we fast forward to chapter 4, and the the religious leaders, they're so disturbed that they were teaching people that that in Jesus there's a resurrection of the dead. So they naturally, as the religious leaders, arrest Peter and John. And they throw them in jail. And the text says, verse 4, that the believers have totaled 5,000, not counting women and children. So because I have Bible college math, that's like 20,000 people all jumping into the scene, all pledging their lives to Jesus, wanting to get baptized, repenting, confessing, believing, all that good stuff, surrendering because they've witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. The next day, the religious leaders, they pull Peter and John out. And they ask him, by what power, by whose name have you done this? Then Peter steps forward, filled with the Holy Spirit. Rulers and elders of our people, let me clearly state to you and all people that that crippled guy was healed by the powerful name of Jesus. The man that you crucified, the man that you let die, he, God brought him back from the dead. There's salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Peter and John were speaking in boldness, with courage and authority, with that sacrificial kind of love. Jesus knew that his disciples needed to know what that looked like. He could have sent them home. He could have given them extra rest so that they could be prepared for what was going to happen. But Jesus knew that he needed them to see what sacrificial love looks like. Here's a little bit about me. I love babies. Um, you got, if, you, if you see me around the church, I'm either in my office reading a book, here standing, playing guitar. Other times, the majority of the time, you'll see me holding a baby, in line to hold a baby, or looking to hold a baby. And you can ask all the new moms, it's kind of annoying. So I apologize. But I love babies. Babies are so fun to hang out with because when babies, baby, in the words of my favorite fictional character, babies are kind of just drawn to me. And I think it's because they see me as one of themselves. But, you know, cooler and with my life a little bit put together. But my favorite baby, he's about to turn two. His name's Micah. 
and Micah is so precious. You guys, is there a picture? Isn't he just so, so good? Micah, he's awesome, you know, and he, he makes the funniest noises. He, he stomps around the house, and he, like, he wants to, like, personify his steps, so he goes, pop, pop, pop. but Micah's cool, you know. Micah will often, whenever, look, kids are so funny, because they'll, they'll imitate you. They'll mimic you. They'll do what you're doing. When I'm on my computer at the dinner table, I'm just typing away, doing something, and Micah will come up, he'll climb up on the bench, and I'll worry because I'm like, can you really do this? And he's climbing up on the bench, and he sits in my lap, and he slams on my keyboard, and I'm like, all right, I don't have a keyboard anymore. When he sees you eating something, he's like, mmm, and he tries to pick it, and you're like, Micah, no, you have a bunch of food allergies. He couldn't. It's rough. When someone's on the phone, he wants to be on the phone, and he'll pick up something like a remote, and he'll talk to it. It's so adorable, but... You know, you guys know what I'm talking about. Kids, they'll just mimic you. They'll imitate you. Little kids like to copy other people, especially bigger kids or bigger people because they literally look up to you guys. After all, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, am I right? But my favorite moment with Micah is one day I was playing Mario Odyssey on the Nintendo Switch. So good. So I'm playing, and as I jump with Mario, and he's about to land on the tiniest sliver of just land... I always exhale because I'm so scared that am I going to make it? I'm like, and all I hear is Micah going, and it's just so cute because I'm going, I'm doing it, I jump, I'm like, I'm like, you and me, Micah, you, me, me, you, you, me. It's just so good. But in that moment when Micah's imitating you, when kids imitate you, what they're saying is, Uncle Kyle, my not so uncle, but kind of, kind of Uncle Kyle, I'm trying to be just like you. When a kid imitates you, I'm trying to be just like you. Because when we're able to experience something, when we set the condition of something on us, we're able to emulate it. I love to tell the story about Jesus. I have a passion to preach and proclaim the gospel, the reality of the resurrection. But I'll tell you what, people in our lives, they can't just hear it. They need to feel it. They need to see it. They need to hold it. They need to wrap their arms around that reality. They need to experience that kind of sacrificial love. Let's pick back up in Acts 4, verses 15 through 19. But when they ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer any man in his name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. Now, watch the sass that comes out in verse 20. Verse 20 is so legendary because of how much sass comes out. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. All right, you guys are probably not catching it. So the Greek literally translates that sentence, the amount of sass in that sentence into, we cannot not speak about the gospel. We cannot not speak about everything that we've seen. We must speak about Jesus. They include this double negative. We must speak about Jesus. They've seen the risen Jesus after his death with their own eyes. They've seen him ascend to glory in God's presence. They, they are the eyewitnesses of his resurrection and his glory. They have heard his instructions concerning the restoration of Israel and their commission to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. The reality of Jesus, the meaning of his life and teaching, the significance of his death, resurrection, and exaltation must not be hushed. We cannot not speak about Jesus. We cannot stop telling everyone of everything that we've seen and heard. The religious leaders, they threatened them even more, and they, they, had, to let, they had to let them go out of prison or they start a riot. Because like my Bible college math deducted for us, there's like 20,000 people there. You know what I mean? Like, that's a riot. But there were so many people stepping forward in faith, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of any issues coming up, regardless of their fear. They were no longer stepping back. They were stepping forward. Let's pick back up in verse 21. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. Everyone was praising God for it. God was getting the credit for the power that was being displayed in these people's lives. 
Then the disciples, they got together and they prayed. And I would encourage you guys to read chapter 4 on your own time and read the prayer because it's, it's, it's amazing. It's a great prayer. Verse 29, And now look, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. What if we were that people? What if we were the people that looked at who Jesus was and we spoke with boldness? If I could just step forward in faith like I saw Jesus doing in John 18, then I could step forward to love people how I sacrificially should. They don't deserve my forgiveness, but they've got it because that's what, I, that's what God did for me. They don't deserve my grace. They don't deserve my love, but they've got it because that's what God does for me. And that your Father in heaven will not only be pleased, but he'll also get the credit that he deserves. Jesus, know, Jesus knew that his disciples, they needed to see him step out in sacrificial love. He knew that they needed to see and that they needed to experience it. Jesus knew that if they experienced it, they would emulate it. After all, how could you not? You know, every moment that the religious leaders told, them, told Peter and John and the disciples to quiet down or threaten them to push them into prison or to throw them in jail or give them some other threat, instead what happened was, Jesus, I'm not going to step back, I'm going to step forward because I'm trying to be just like you. When the disciples were threatened even more so, Jesus, I'm trying to be just like you. So what does our Father hear in every action that we do? Does the Father hear, Jesus, I'm trying to be just like you? I am, I am he, means I am sacrificial love in the flesh, the demonstration. When we take time out of our very busy schedules, because you know we live in Maryland, our very busy schedules to come and serve at church, that's saying to Jesus, that's saying to God, Jesus, I'm trying to be just like you. When we're driving and that one guy cuts us off in traffic, instead of honking our horn, you know, you guys know what I say, the horn of encouragement, or the headlights of enlightenment, instead we give him that hand, the, you know, the universal sign for, hey, you're good, all good in the hood. If we're trying to say, Jesus, I'm trying to be just like you. When we go out of our comfort zones into the people that we don't necessarily hang out with, into the people that we don't want to hang out with because they don't look like us, they don't talk like us, they don't believe like us, they don't vote like us. Instead, when we cultivate and rationally go out and intentionally love these type of people, the Father hears us echoing, Jesus, I'm trying to be just like you. If there's one thing that you're going to take out of my nervous stuttering, my misplacement of words, and my inability to pronounce some words. It's that I am he means I am the, the human, the in-flesh demonstration of sacrificial love. And what that means for us is much larger. It's a commission to go out and do. Because we want to be just like Jesus every moment that we get, whether it's in-house or outside. And I think it's important to understand just where this takes place because it doesn't just take place with the people that we hang out with in the Christian church. And contrary to popular belief, a lot of people like to so sh show sacrificial love to people outside the church so that they can come to church. But a lot of people in the church are a little judgmental. So when we can start becoming the I am statement and start showing the sacrificial love in the church, outside the church, in the homes, in the communities, in the public schools, that's the life-changing power the sacrificial love in the body of Jesus so that the Father can hear it. Jesus, I'm trying to be just like you. Let's stand in prayer. Hallelujah, holy, holy God.